Welcome back to the show. This week is a super special one. You know, we began this show in early February of 2018, and believe it or not, this is our 100th consecutive week of broadcasting nationwide. It's a huge milestone for us, and I genuinely cannot express with words how honored and how grateful that I am to come to you every single week to talk about important issues that are shaping the future of our nation. It's truly been one of the greatest honors of my life to meet with you every single week in a spirit of love and a spirit of care for Canada. On this broadcast journey, one of the most precious things to me is the moments when I'm sitting in the office and I get to pick up the phone or read the mail that comes in and I read it all and I get to hear your stories and your heart for Canada. I know that every one of you watching this broadcast loves Canada just as much as we do and we are so grateful for your partnerships and your prayers and your encouragement. And as a matter of fact, right here, I have pulled actually a few notes that we have received from from viewers that I just wanted to share with you before we throw to some highlight clips from this past year. So this is a, a precious note from Karen in Paris, Ontario. She says this, thank you for your Christian based and very informative presentations on so many topics facing Canadians today. I enjoy your Sunday broadcast and appreciate you asking some of the very same questions that I have on a variety of topics. You're truly a sound voice in this time of disinformation and misdirection. Bless you and your ministry. Thank you so much, Karen. Here's another one from Sherry. She says this, I'd like to thank you for your tireless effort in promoting good values for our nation. The Lord has given you a strong voice and may he continue to download his plans and purposes into your heart with all encouragement, showing you how to boldly proclaim his love and truth. Thank you so much. I pray for increase uh, in this ministry and in every area of your life. I'm sending a donation in today and there's several more. And I, we just wanna say that we treasure your partnership. These words bring us so much life and so much encouragement and I hope that those notes also encouraged you as well so okay now we want to get to some highlights from 2019 we've broken down today's show into three main categories number one the most eye-opening segments of 2019 number two the most moving ones and number three the most inspirational clips of 2019. I gotta tell you this though it was so hard to choose and if we had more time in this bro broadcast I would have included so many more picks because we had so many incredible guests this year speaking to very important issues for our nation. Uh, in a moment we're going to begin with the most eye-opening clips but before that a special word of encouragement to us from none other than contemporary mother of media in Canada and Crossroads CEO, Lorna Duick. I cannot even express with words how honored <laughs> I am to have you in studio, in your own studio that I use every once in a while. But you are literally the mother of media in Canada right now. I can think of no one else that's deeper into this than you in the Faith community. So thank you for being with me today. And we're so proud to see Faithine produced here in this in the Crossroads studio. Uh, you know, this is uh, such an unprecedented thing that a new television show gets up, gets running, and you're doing such a great job. You know mm -hmm. Ottawa so well. You know our Christian prayer community across the country so well. We just want to cheer you, support you. We're thrilled that you can produce here. Aww. And uh, we're with you all the way, Faitine. You've done a wonderful job. This is what, season four for you? Uh, five or six, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I lose track. I have small yeah, children, so yeah. you know, you lose yeah. track. At this moment in our national history, um, is it important for people of faith to be involved in the conversation? Or, and if so, why or why not? Well, what media does, it tells you who is Canada. It, you know, you, we get our identity from what we see. So, oh, we recognize that, we recognize this. If you are a follower of Christ, if you are a person of any faith group in Canada, and you never see yourself in media, the national conversation then unfolds that there probably is no faith in Canada, or it is marginalized, or it's not important. So it's absolutely critical that we have shows like Fateen, shows like All the Things Crossroads, and Yes TV produces, because we are privileged to give an identity to the faith community, and that's why we need to be in media. The 
What are some of the cases that you're working on right now? Well, this one in Ontario where the uh, Muskoka Child and Family Services is uh, denying, uh, there's a, a Baptist couple, pastor and his wife, uh, have a heart for adopting kids. They went through the application process and they passed everything with flying colors that they're, you know, stable and have a good relationship and would be good adoptive parents, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the agency says that because they believe in the Bible uh, and because they accept Bible's teachings about gender and sexuality and, and, uh, and marriage and so on, they're not fit to adopt children because of their evangelical Christian beliefs about sexuality. So we've sent a warning letter and uh, thus far uh, not making a difference, so it, it may end up going to court. So that's an example. We had a similar case in Alberta, actually, where the government did back down. Uh, that also, the couple in Edmonton, uh, evangelical Christians, were found to be, would be fantastic adoptive parents. You know, they went through all the different screening process and interviews and applications and whatnot. And just because of their beliefs about sexuality, we're told that they could not be loving parents for a child that was same-sex attracted. So these are very v vigorous or vicious attacks against religious freedom, and they have to be fought because if you don't fight these, and if you cave, cave in and roll over, uh, things just get worse and worse. I would say that the carbon tax has been sold to Canadians as, you know, really just affecting the big emitters. But at the end of the day, it's average Canadians that are that are paying the bills for this. So when you think of seniors who are on fixed incomes or other low income Canadians that when they go to the grocery store, now the price of all essentials, uh, grocery items, fruit, uh, healthy, you know, vegetables, all of that goes up because everything at the grocery store is transported, you know, on our roads. So that takes fuel to get there. And at the end of the, you know, when they're paying for their groceries, it's not about buying a more tax or fuel efficient car. Uh, this can, you know, hit you at, in the grocery lineup. So it really is quite a bit more expensive um, with the carbon tax. When you've got, you know, the United States is a massive emitter in comparison to Canada, has not signed on to the Paris agreements. India, China as well continue to see emissions go up. So it's not that Canada should do nothing, but there are other ways to reduce our carbon footprint that aren't going to hurt vulnerable Canadians. Tax Freedom Day represents the day that the average Canadian finally has reached the point that they've stopped paying uh, all of their money to the government in taxes, and then they can start keeping the money that they earn. So, so about the middle of the year. Yes, uh, this year it fell on June 14th. So up until June 13th, the average Canadian, all everything that they had earned from January 1st until June 13th had all gone to the government in forms of taxes. So three different levels of government. Okay, can you say that again? So 45, on average, 45% of each family's income goes to the government at three different levels, so federal, provincial, and municipal. 45% of family income goes to pay tax. The goal for writing the culture war was I realized very quickly that the vast majority of people don't know how we got to this place. They don't know how we got to a culture where abortion is accepted, where boys can become girls, where porn use is ubiquitous, and where sexual morality has fundamentally been flipped upside down. Starting at the beginning, what stunned me about the sexual revolution and that sort of research was simply the fact that uh, so much of what our culture believes to be true is not only a lie, but those who originally sold it to the public knew that it was a lie in the first place. And we see this uh, with abortion, for example, where the numbers of, of, back, of back alley abortions, to give you one example, were transparently made up. And Dr. Bernard Nathanson, one of the two founders of NARO, admits he made them up in his memoir. We see uh, with the numbers of people that were apparently engaging in sexual activity outside of marriage in the Kinsey reports, we found out 40 years later that those numbers were not only made up, but that the founders of the study actually classified uh, convicted sex offenders as normal people in order to trick the public into believing that the vast majority of Americans in that instance um, did not believe in biblical sexual morality. And so on, on each and every one of these issues, 
issues, what I ended up discovering is that the story that we often still believe to be true today simply didn't happen the way that everybody thinks that it happened. Wow. And, and, and that, that gives people a lot of, 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 of real, um, um, how shall I say it, confidence because Christianity is under such assault today and we're told that we're wrong and the evidence proves us wrong. And so when you start digging into the evidence and you realize uh, the extent to which we've been sold a bad bill of goods, it really does strengthen your convictions. Genuinely, pornography is the greatest threat to childhood, to children, to family that our culture has ever seen. And cops are warning Canadian parents that this is common. Make sure you know what your kids are doing with phones. Wow. Because screen time is, is just, it's so incredibly ubiquitous. And, and, I'll, and I'll just mention that the, the Silicon Valley experts who actually create this technology don't let their own kids use this technology because they know how dangerous it is. And so we've ended up in the situation where the average age of first exposure to pornography is nine years old. I speak in high schools, uh, Christian schools primarily, on the topic of pornography all the time. And the average kid that I meet started, look, started looking at porn in grade six. I was approached by the directors of a few different organizations who had, um, they had brainstormed a big vision to commemorate the 50th anniversary of legalized abortion in Canada. You know, we call it the missing project because there's so much missing in the abortion debate in Canada. You know, number one, there's a missing law. There's missing people. There's missing information and health care for women. There's um, missing... Uh, medical facts, there's missing statistics, there's so much missing. We have one testimony from a woman who said, uh, I grew up as a single child and I always wanted an older brother or sister or a brother or sister and, and then my mother told me that she had an abortion when she was 17 and, and how that broke you know, this woman that I talked to, you know, and she wasn't there during it, but it's the ripple effects of how it impacts everybody around you and not just at that time but in the future as well. You know, so the friends that I've talked to who are, you know, what are you doing now? And I said, did, did you know we don't have an abortion law? And, and they're shocked, they, they can't believe it. And you know, we're, we're in league with, you know, countries like North Korea, you know? Um, they think a developed country, you know, like Canada, who's got all these resources and, um, you know, we, we're so wise and everything, we should have a law, but we don't. Through The Faye Teen Show, we're tackling issues influencing our nation's future, like freedom of conscience, racism, poverty, the debt, human trafficking, abortion, democracy, and much more. If you missed a show, you can watch anytime at fayteen.tv or on YouTube. We hope to see you there. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 613-552-5572 to donate today. Prayer is undeniably one of the most powerful forces in the universe. It has the power to reach through walls, across regions, and into the hardest of situations to bring change. It has the power to save lives. That is why we're committed to raising up 24-7 prayer for our nation. Through the Justice Wall, you can sign up for a 15-minute prayer slot every week to pray for life in Canada, to pray for an end to human trafficking, and for godly government in every region of our nation. Sign up for one or many weekly prayer times. You'll even be given weekly reminders and prayer directives if you want them. Visit www.justicewall.com to sign up for your time and join with believers from sea to sea who are standing on guard for our nation every week through prayer. www.justicewall.com So one of the things that we've seen is a lot of patients um, being pressured, I would say unduly, into considering uh, euthanasia. So you'll have the, you know, every week they'll come to you in the hospital and say, are you sure you don't want 
assisted suicide. Have you considered assisted suicide? You'll have um, patients being shown, you know, this is what you're going to look like in six months if you don't take assisted suicide. This is the way you're going to suffer. So there's a lot of framing of the um, patient journey for patients that is having them think that they don't have any other options. And now obviously this isn't every doctor because I'm sure there's tons of doctors out there that are you know, giving um, you know, ideas about palliative care options, though that's limited in Canada, the access to it. Uh, but what you are saying is that this is happening, that there's been a shift in mindset about end of life care. Right, and you'll see it with um, people, particularly people who are quite ill or who have disabilities, that they are somehow feeling diminished by this, that their lives aren't valuable, and so therefore that assisted suicide or euthanasia is really the best option for everyone. If I had to go ahead and do what the doctors wanted me to do, I wouldn't have had her. What was that? Well, they wanted me to do assisted suicide death on her. This is your story. <laughs> yeah. You said a couple of things on the CBC News story. Yeah. I remember they said, did you want to die? And what did you say? I don't want, I don't want to she got sick here at home. We got the ambulance. When we got her to the hospital, she was having seizures. Um, they had to give her medication to take her heart rate down. Her heart rate was quite up, very high, up to 170. This doctor that was seeing her first, and he came in, he told me that her kidney wasn't in the right spot. He told me the lower parts of her lungs had collapsed, so he admitted her. And the next day, uh, when he came in, he took me out in the hallway and he just stood me up against the wall and he told me about assisted suicide death was legal in Canada and I said well he asked did I know and I said no and then he said uh, he was all for it and I said well that was your choice and I told him I wasn't interested in anything to do with assisted suicide death and he told me he said uh, I was being selfish and he wanted to assist me in doing this and I said I'm not interested. I more or less walked away from her. She heard everything, yeah. and... Did you heard what the doctor said? Yeah. How did that make you feel? Not feeling good. Like, not once did she ever say to them, I want to end my life, not once. You said they talked about it a lot. Did they talk about it a lot with you? Yeah. And this doctor came in, and next day, after he told me about the assisted suicide death, and stuck his face down to hers and said, do you know how sick you are? And I'm just like, and when I got his eyes contact, I went, well, I was like that to get out in the hallway. And I told him, I said, don't you ever pull something like that again. So at that time, were you worried that Candace was going to die? They had us and told me that she was dying. I, I believed them. They were the doctors, and she was so sick. So but I told her if she wanted to go, it was cool. She could go. But she didn't. She don't feel me, honey. But she didn't want me to be alone. Don't cry. It's all done now. It's over. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. <sighs> wow. So th this is part of a documentary that is uh, going to be released here pretty quickly. Actually, I think screenings are already happening for it. But that dynamic, man. Oh, first of all, that little girl so precious. Yes. Yeah. And, and that mom so awesome <laughs> to stick yeah. up to the doctor. I'm the Global Mission Pastor at the People's Church, and so I'm constantly, one of my discernment pieces is always to ask the Lord, where should we be going? Where is the greatest need? So when I was praying this prayer, the Lord said, nowhere. And so I, I took that as a bit of a rebuke to sort of say, slow down, you know, pay attention to the partners that you have. Then one day as I was praying, I'll often use um, different video clips and, and YouTube to stay current with what's happening in the world. And I was following sort of a line that was covering uh, refugees. And I was praying into that situation. And suddenly um, it took me to a virtual tour. The virtual tour started by saying, welcome, to Kakuma refugee camp in northern Kenya. Kakuma, which means in Swahili, nowhere. Wow. God hadn't been saying go nowhere in the sense of don't go anywhere else, but go nowhere where millions 
actually 68.5 million people are presently living. Refugees find themselves absolutely unprotected. Um, they don't have a government. They don't have a nationality. Um, and so the church is the perfect body to be able to step into that space with them. Mm. And, and be their nation. And be their nation, <laughs> literally. Wow. All of a sudden, nowhere starts to surge Canada, right? We yes. see this mass influx of refugees. So you have three little babies. Do you have a wife as well? Yeah, I have a wife. And were you fleeing some sort of persecution or just wanting to build a better life for? No, persecution, uh, honestly, because people say when you come to Canada, you are living because of uh, uh, economic uh, stuff. But I can tell you back home, my wife was a banker and I own my own little business. I have few staffs working with me, but my, I have two daughters and a son. Where I came from, my community, they still believe in uh, uh, girls' uh, circumstition. So I went to school, my wife went to school, we are graduates, so we don't believe in that. But they don't want to know because my father, so at that time, my father is, didn't go to school, so people are around. So, it was a taboo in my community if the girls are not circumcised. Wow. Yeah. So, so you were really coming to protect your children? 100%. The church has such opportunity to meet wonderful families mm. like Samuel's family. Um, it's just such a wonderful, um, a wonderful gift. And it is not, it, it's not sacrifice, it's not difficult mm -hmm. to make new friends mm -hmm. yeah. with people who are coming to the country mm -hmm. to be a friend mm -hmm. that's what the church was built for as mm -hmm. a body i can go that yeah, yeah to just enjoy each other's company so we really have to get rid of our judgment mm -hmm. and we have to understand what would we do what would i do for my girls right. what would you do for your girls right um here's a good father okay um i have an oil field trucking company um how it's impacted me personally, I used to have 19 employees. Now I'm down to, well, two paid. I haven't taken a wage in quite a while, over two years, just trying to hold my people together, one of them being my daughter. So I am in the oil field industry, but I see it in real estate. There is so many commercial and residential properties that are going in foreclosure. People that are, credit cards are maxed right out. They're wondering, they're looking at their last roll of toilet paper and wondering if they should use washcloths. Divorces, suicides. Hmm. The mental health is rising. I don't know what to say to that, you know? Our natural resources aren't going anywhere anytime soon. There's a demand for it. Our natural resources um, are ethical. When you bring this message to our federal leaders, what do they say? It's quiet. We're not hearing anything other than he would like to phase out our oil and gas. Mm -hmm. Because of environmental reasons. Many reasons. <laughs> Our federal current government in power is not really looking for the Canadian choice. What's happening for Canada right now is not happening for Canada. It's happening to Canada. Wow. That's a powerful statement. And the mayor that was running at the time called our downtown the worst downtown in Canada. And he was right. John O'Star picked it up and so the, we wanted to be right in the middle of that. And uh, the first time my mom came to visit us in Brantford, she asked if a bomb had gone off in our downtown. It was really a mess. But we decided we were going to plant a church. So we found a bar in the middle of the downtown, decided that's where we're going to start. So we bought that and started, uh, started doing our church there. And we realized that one of the felt needs of our city was kindness. Um, Canadians, I always say, we're not cold to each other, but we're also not in each other's lives like we once were on purpose. And so we began to look for as many different ways as we possibly could to sow the idea that kindness could transform a city into our community. We started doing free barbecues on the street from 10 o'clock at night until 2 o'clock in the morning because that's when the neighborhood surrounding our former bar where people were running drugs out of the that's kitchen when before. everybody wants and a hot dog. That was the <laughs> <laughs> hot time of night for a street for a street hot dog and so we just started yelling free burgers free hot dogs <laughs> and we started to build relationship with some of the people who were the influencers in a bad way for the downtown what that ended up doing was 
unlocking our minds to what, how far can we take this? How much further can we take this? Where can we go and use kindness uh, a step further? One of the, you mentioned my uh, secret identity is Captain Kindness. What, we planned lots of things, but this superhero was a surprise. The theme for the Santa Claus parade now almost 10 years ago was superheroes. And we thought, well, let's put Dave in a leotard and stick him up on a flatbed truck and call him Captain Kindness because this is what we, we are doing our outreach under. Well, this float won the award for the best float in the Santa Claus parade, I started to get calls and go, can Captain Kindness come to my school? Can Captain Kindness cut the ribbon on my fish and chip stand? And next thing I knew, the next year, I was lighting the city Christmas tree with the mayor and Santa Claus and me in a superhero leotard. And I Come thought, on. I always figured I'd be on the stage, but I didn't think I'd have a cape on. Wow, <laughs> that is so fun. Thank you so much for joining me today for this special 100th week of broadcasting Fateen.tv. It's been so heartwarming looking back over the year and these highlights. And in case you were not aware, we want to remind you that you can watch and rewatch any show in its entirety anytime at Fateen.tv or on our YouTube channel under Fateen Show. Wow, what a journey, joy, and honor it has been. We're so grateful for the eyes that have been opened and the lives that have been touched through these shows. However, the truth is that we would not still be here if it was not for you. And so before entering into television, Robert and I were doing full-time nonprofit advocacy and humanitarian work and also chasing little people, otherwise known as our children. But when we stepped into television in early 2018, our budget literally quintupled overnight. And every month we have been walking on water in faith, believing God to pay the bills. Why did our budget quintuple? Well, simply put, faith-based television in Canada is the only TV other than advertising that has to pay to go on the air. Every other program gets paid. The cards were stacked against us from the beginning, but against all odds, we finished our first year in the black at the end of 2018 because of you and your generosity and launched into 2019, almost tripling our reach, airing on eight stations 13 times a week, almost all in primetime spots. And this has only been made possible because of your heart for Canada and because of your generosity. So we wanna say thank you. Uh, this is why we're still here talking about the issue shaping our nation and we believe that the next year is going to be an even better one so as we close 2019 and begin 2020 we want to ask if you might consider joining our monthly partnership team it's actually our monthly partners and our faithful givers that keep us going and when you sign up to partner for $50 a month or more or increase your partnership by $25 a month or more, we will send you a special appreciation gift in the mail from our hearts to yours. Thank you again for standing with us and thank you for considering joining with us to build a better Canada for the future. Every bit makes a huge difference. You can sign up to partner or give a special gift today by visiting fateen.tv or calling 613-552-5572. Bless you, bless your loved ones and God bless Canada.